All right, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome again to the eighth day of the 12 days of Christmas. Actually, I have to give a big shout out to my dear friend, Gina. If uh, anybody takes pictures or you want to comment on this on Instagram, I now have the perfect hashtag thanks to her. So you can do hashtag one, two, D-O-C. So hashtag 12 D-O-C days of Christmas. So uh, we're definitely hoping that we're going to continue on with this, maybe make it a holiday tradition every year. But as of right now, we've really, really been enjoying this program. I know I have. Thank you so much to everybody for all of your feedback with regards to the program. And just to kind of backtrack a little bit, maybe for anybody who is watching it and is new, this whole idea, very last minute, albeit as I am famous for, I just kind of pulled it out of my hat. And for me, it was just a way to get into the holiday spirit, even though the holidays are kind of over, you know, as I've been saying over and over again, as small business and involved in retail, and I'm sure Lisa can also, you know, feel this as well, you know, as part of being in the yarn store, but like, you know, you're just so busy taking care of everybody else's preparations for the holiday that I often feel like I just don't get into the holiday spirit as much as I would like to, or to do things for myself as much as I would like to, and to enjoy people, spread joy, you know, just enjoy community. And so the joke is like people who are really, really planning ahead, there's that whole advent thing. That's way too much preparation for, for my life whatsoever. And then, you know, I started thinking about, okay, what could be like a little kitsch and then thought about the 12 days of Christmas. Mind you, as I've said repeatedly, I thought that meant maybe that was the 12 days prior to Christmas. Lo and behold, as I researched it, no, it was perfect. It was like after Christmas and through the New Year's. So I've really just put this together as a way to surround ourselves with people in our fiber community, crafting community, but also agricultural community. So just tried to really have a lot of diversity. Some of our guests, many of you know, because I've worked with them before, and I've definitely brought some new guests to the table as I did last night. Plus, I hope there are always still new people joining us time and time again. So even somebody like my dear friend, Lisa, um, maybe you haven't been with us in the past and you're newer and not familiar with who she is and how we know each other and how we've worked together. So that's the whole idea of the 12 days of Christmas. We still have a great lineup as we run through to the sixth, our culminating event, which I'm of course looking forward to. And as many of you also know, but we'll go over it at the end of the program. Don't forget, I've got this great gift basket that we are raffling off valued at about $550. And there's some stuff from Lisa Hoffman in here as well. So I know you all will be looking forward to that raffle drawing on Friday night for our last Zoom together. So with that, I would like for my guest to introduce herself tell her a little bit about us briefly, of course, and then we're just going to catapult in a million different directions because I'm already saying we can go into what you do for me, what you do for yourself, what you do for string, what you do on the side for your directed knitting, like, I mean, the books that you've done and you know, with your cousin. And I mean, there's just like a million different things. And of course, talking a little bit about our weird triangle and llamas. And so um, I'm just excited to dive into it. Oh, and also as a fabulous designer, basically you and Kimberly McElinden, the two people that hands down, I would welcome to do a pattern for me any day because they're always good. They always work. Um, so I'm sure maybe people even have some designing questions for you as well too. So take it away. Um, I think you just did the best introduction. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, is, on, I didn't even say your full name. And so I am Lisa Hoffman. I live in New York City. I have a house out on Long Island. Hence, this is how I started um, my journey knowing Tabitha many, many years ago. Uh, I am a knitwear designer, teacher. I've published a book with my cousin, Alice Hoffman, who is actually my husband's first cousin, hence we have the same last name, called Fairy Knitting. Um, I've done patterns for Tabitha. Whenever she asks me to do something, I will do it. I shouldn't say that because don't <laughs> ask me like that. I'm just too busy all the time. But I try- That would be pre-COVID, pre-COVID. 
it's hard for me to say no whenever you ask, so I will always do what I can. Um, and currently I work at String in New York City, which is a small yarn shop on Lexington and 73rd Street. And um, I don't know what else to... <laughs> Well, we can go in a million different directions from there. Don't worry, I got you okay. on all of this. But right. I can't think, do you have any idea how long ago it was that we met? I... It was when you were doing the- I'm looking because West, I'm like- You, you were doing the West Hampton uh, Beach- Oh, the farmer's, farmer's market? market. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That and was when I- there? You were there with a llama or spinning and or spinning and with yarn and your stuff. And I went up to you and introduced myself. I think I was like, you know, just also knitting at that time um, as a knitter, not as in the in the business or anything. And uh, but I was just so intrigued that there was a llama there because I had known Philip for many, many years. All right. Well, wait, so and hang on. So wait, wait, we're so gonna... it's a whole nother part of the story. And no, I went I'm up to Tabitha to it. and I, and I said, I have a friend that also has llamas. Do you know him? And I mentioned Philip's name and she went, why? She said, of course I know Phil and Larry. So it was like an immediate connection that we both had this very good friend in common. And it for me, it was like worlds colliding. Like I had no idea about the lot this that there was this big llama world. And I had no idea that this big llama world was going to be part of my life at all, <laughs> other than, you know, Bell's farm. So I, I've added our our special guest, Phil Finer. And um, just because when Lisa and I, so Lisa already mentioned, of course, about string. And so those of you that have been with us, uh, perhaps maybe on the night where we had um, Becky Kevelson from Clinton Hill Cashmere and her mom, Lori, there was a lot of talk about string. So we can, you know, even connect that. And Lisa was on with us. And then she had the idea. She's like, I should ask Phil to be in on this because I forget all the time about how he like adds into our weird mm. little trial triangle and so so talk again about how you and and philip know each other because obviously you guys have known each other a lot longer than i've known you but then based on that i wonder if i've known philip as long as you and him have known <laughs> like do you know what i mean like it goes this way and i, I think way. i win yeah i think lisa wins because i've known i've been friends with andrew since before Lisa and Andrew even met, I think. Yes. Um, and then, so that was that connection. And then I became friends with Lisa when they got engaged or when they met and, you know, what, went to the wedding, went to the kids, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, all that fun stuff. And then- How many years ago was that though then? I would say probably close to 40. 40 oh, years. That's amazing. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. I always say Philip and Larry are our oldest couple friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> They've so, been with us from the beginning. Yeah. And we've had the farm we've for the it. last, let's see, we've had the farm for the last 33 years. Wow. So, um, so pro for as long as I've known Lisa or Andrew and Lee, how long have you guys been married? A long time. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> how long have we married? 37 years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So after the after they got married, then we had the farm and they've come up to they come up to the farm regularly and stuff. And their kids went to camp up here in in, in, in Pittsfield, right? Winnedoo, mm -hmm. I think. Um, you know, so we would get together when the kids were in camp and all that kind of stuff. And then yeah, it just turns out that they were they they met you and it was like, how wait, you met Tabitha? I know Tabitha because I know Tabitha from so you mentioned Lars and Gail. So there was a farm in Vermont called West Mountain Farm, and Tabitha was friends with Lars and Gail, the owner of that farm. And well, we, they are who got me started in llamas. Yeah, and so. and we got our first llamas 
you know, Charlie and Ozzy, a pair of sheep guards from Lars and Gail. I don't know if I knew that. Yeah. So I mean, maybe would, you helped me, but. We would, we would go to their, you know, what was it, Memorial Day and Labor Day open houses or whatever. Yeah. You know? the and, um, that they did. and then I think you and I also, we had a horse background as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, and then you figure I started showing i mean i started llamas in like 95 96 they say 96 as far as my logo but then mm -hmm. i didn't start showing until it was either 2000 or 2001 okay. and then you were you know well on. and i'm a scene. llama judge yeah so you were well on yeah. the scene already but were you i don't think you were judging at that time uh I pro yeah probably not i don't think so because yeah, i think i, think I started judge judging in like on. like like 20 years ago or 18 something like that years ago so yeah. and then for those of you guys that follow my journey and you know our animals and you know so this whole weird world of like showing llamas and then you know I in my early days remember I actually used to even show your llamas for you yep. mm -hmm. I would go and you know just because I wanted to do anything and everything I could related to llamas and I forget maybe you were were you not traveling at the time or I don't even remember why yeah, you, but, you know sometimes you know it was you know that so our I, I was a weekender at our farm up until only about I would say about six or seven years ago when I moved up here full time so before that so if I wanted to go to a show and maybe I was busy at work or something yeah Tabitha would pinch it you know, I remember driving. I remember one drive to Fort Worth, Texas. Oh my God! I driving, talk about driving through like a hailstorm in in I in in know. Nashville, thinking that we were all going to die. You know? I tell that story all the time because Philip and I got to be really good friends. Of course, I I was so excited. You know, I was like a young kid at the time. You know, he had gorgeous llamas. You know, he was something. I was just starting to be something. So for me to be able to like show his llamas, I was like ecstatic about it. And I would, you know, go all the way out of my way to go up to Steventown, New York, pick up his animals, you know, bring them to the show, take care of them, all of that kind of stuff. But there was the one time he's like, I want to go to Fort Worth, Texas, because you had, well, actually I ended up buying her. How did that work out? But that's mm. when I remember you had MHF Easy as Pie. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. And you had her in the sale. And I don't know if you had another animal in the sale, but we would go to llama shows. And then at these shows, they would also have very like high end auctions, not bad auctions, good auctions. Mm -hmm. And I'm of course like, I mean, auctions are pretty scary. And I think if I remember correctly, because you had to be with your animal. Mm -hmm. So somebody who is auctioning off their animal, they will have people in the audience to like kind of keep the bidding going and, mm -hmm. you know, and do things. But then my God, guys, the stress, because you're like, you don't know if you raise your hand, not raise your hand. You can't <laughs> understand a flipping word of what that guy is saying. I'm having a complete anxiety attack, like don't know what's happening because I don't want to like fail on, you know, mm -hmm. Phil. And I, I think it went smoothly, but I think you didn't end up getting the money that you wanted. And so there was a reserve for it. And that's why you were going to go home with her. And then somehow or other, she ended up going home with me. Uh -huh. It is. But on the way home, no, you could have seen his truck and trailer get up. <laughs> Phil does everything to the nines. Everything is beautiful. Everything is gorgeous. Everything is over the top. I wish I had the thought to grab one of your ribbons for your llama shows you used to give out. Those damn ribbons. <laughs> those those are head. great ribbons. They really, were dinner yeah. plates and they were as long as your body. Anyway, he has this gorgeous rig, gorgeous rig. He's making me drive it. And <laughs> in a snowstorm where you're on the main highway and the trucks, the trailers are just flying past you, you know, the big tractor trailer. And you're holding the steering wheel like this. I am like <laughs> not holding the steering wheel. Cannot even barely see what we're doing. No offense, Phil. He's squealing over there, like not even <laughs> helping me. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to kill all of us. I was like, it was the craziest thing because this was February in right. the Fort Worth. And while we were there, that's when they had an inch of snowfall and they declared it a state of emergency. That was funny as hell. Mm -hmm. So, oh, that was a crazy trip. It was a fun that trip. Was a crazy crazy trip. trip. And I came home with the most amazing custom cowboy boots. Oh my God, I love them. <laughs> Not to mention, I remember you had a really fun time. The fact that we were at a rodeo too with all the cowboys. Yes, the cowboys. And they were real cowboys. 
And they, they, were, they, won, they won, you know, New York City Cowboys. <laughs> they were real Cowboys. It was amazing. It was amazing. So, yeah. And then, of course, I will say that one of my fondest things that I have to absolutely share, um, even though he is just relatively recently no longer with us, oh, anybody baby. that's been with me for a number of years, you might know or remember our Llama Double, as we called him, or Dub Dubs. And... Um, I'll never forget it. It was at the Big E, and I don't know if it was your show or if it was the Big E, and I remember Kathy Kindler pulled him out to performance train him as mm -hmm. like an example for a judging class, and I don't know. I don't know how I ended up purchasing him from you, but you weren't going to use him as a breeding animal, and he was like five or six already at the time, and we ended up gelding him, and he became the most amazing youth llama that like really almost we ever had. I mean, he had the best personality. He, he had the know. sweetest personality. And I mean, he was 10 times over national champion, youth champions. And actually my fondest memories is a boy that was with me for a super long time who was um, high function, higher functioning, but very autistic. And uh, double was his llama. Mm. Um, I had another girl that had uh, cerebral palsy and uh, double was her llama, you know, so he just always always took care of kids and just the sweetest 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 guy so um he lived to a good ripe old age of 23 and um you know we were really happy to have him here for that long but yeah. you know i uh i owe you for that so that's always gonna have us connected i'll have mm -hmm. to post some pictures afterwards of uh of dubs so but uh and once 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 we all got together so remember that in the city right. We mm -hmm. all had a chance to get together. So the six of us uh, all had dinner. So it was kind of really fun to have our, our triangle together there. How was that only once? How come we only did that once? That's crazy. I don't know. How is it? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen you in forever. And I will I also say, so Philip is a llama judge, but he also has his llamas up at his farm. Now, here's another weird connection. When we had Lori Kimmel Steele and Becky Kevelson on, <laughs> um, so Lori's husband has her beehives on the farm that's right next door to Philip. And then also during COVID, Becky from Clinton Hill Cashmere was staying up in Steventown with um, her mom. And then so Becky and her kids came over to watch me shear Philip's animals when I was there shearing, because I usually have the fortunateness to shear your animals every year, depending on how fast I get up there. But um, so it's just there's so many different weird connections and it's and it's great. I love when worlds collide. It is. It is a small world, especially the Kimmelstein thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one more one more thing, because you have so my dear Sir Arthur, you have his arch rival nemesis. Um, why am I his name begins with a B? Why am I escaping? Beckham. It? Beckham, Beckham, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so sort of growing up, Sir Arthur's big rival was a male that Philip owns. Um, and his name is Beckham. I mean, you own him now, but back when, uh, Mark, right, Mark had him, him. Yeah. that was like the llama we were, and I'll never, ever, ever forget. It was like the showdown at the Big E. <laughs> I had to beat Beckham. Sorry. <laughs> I, mean, so, I mean, now that you owe him, it wasn't it wasn't about you owning him. I don't right, think right. At that time, it was like Mark owned him, mm -hmm. and I remember the only thing that was going to keep us was Sir Arthur always has such a sour face. He always puts his ears back, and if you met his dam, you know why he has that face. So I clicker trained that freaking llama to make sure he would put his ears up, like uh. as we were in the ring. I mean, I put so much pressure on myself to like just. <laughs> Beckham. Anyway, so and that was just like a little like friendly, not so friendly competition um, between uh, Sir Arthur and Beckham. So that was pretty fun. And and yes, we won. But either way, I was, and I was gonna ask who won. The, out in the pasture and enjoying and getting fat, getting staying fat. I shouldn't say I was just gonna fat, say yeah. well, I, I will say him and Sir Arthur both have very similar bodies. They both have dad uh -huh. bodies, you know. Yeah, so. you know. <laughs> He, he but, carries his groceries. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I always enjoy. And then the last thing, because Phil, you're so funny that way. Philip has to be the only one that in his barn, um, first of all, there's a sign above the, <laughs> above the shearing chute that says beauty shop. 
And he also has a chandelier um, <laughs> hanging in it. We had just saw Deanna's face go. Yes, he has a chandelier hanging right in the shearing area, the grooming area. There's a chandelier above the chute. Um, I am sure he's the only one that has that as well. So that just <laughs> shows you uh, a little bit of his taste, of course. Um, and it's, it's now home to my um, multitude of barn sp sparrows who, no. you know, have like taken over that barn and like shit all over the place. Uh, <laughs> we, were just, we were just talking about that today too. Somebody was asking actually with Kristen and Lisa here, they were uh, asking about birds and things. And I said, no, thankfully I don't have any birds in my barn yet because I hear they're a nightmare. So. Oh, it's a pain in the rear end. They're in the creek theater <laughs> eating, eating grain, you know, all the time. <laughs> You know, but hey, you know, they, it is they, they, they have to survive the winter as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to give a shout out for Philip, though, guys, if anybody's looking to get away from whatever rat race it is that you live in, or if you live in the city, or you're looking to get up to the country, he has an amazing little place on his llama farm that is uh, through Airbnb. Um, and he, he does quite well with it. So absolutely cute, adorable, cozy. The llamas are like literally right out your door. So if anybody's looking to get up. Beckham is in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so just giving a, a shout out. Do you have it on a website or anything, Philip? Uh, yeah, it's on my Maple Hill Farms website. Okay. Or, or I can just send whoever if you want, just text me and I can send you the Airbnb link. Thank you. Tyler. Yeah, well, and a lot yeah. of people too might just go looking for you. So even though I don't think you're on, you're not on Instagram, right? I am, but I rarely access it. I was going to say, I tried to tag you and then it was like, uh -huh. finer and there was no face. And I'm like, <laughs> there you go. I'm like, that tells you how Larry often I'm there. there. I know Larry might not have been him. <laughs> exactly exactly so maple hill farms guys that is philip and larry uh their place is up in steventown new york or i'm sure you can go to airbnb and also do a search if anybody's looking to go there because also don't forget we're going to be uploading this to youtube people will be watching it so uh maybe that'll end up somebody will be coming your way as a result of it so thank you yeah, well, thank you. So thanks so much for being with us. And you're welcome to hang out if you like. But uh, I'm going to remove Spotlight. And then we're going to continue on, of course, with Lisa. And oh, it's been so nice to see him and to hear you guys chat about all that uh... It's all so the llama fun. business. The whole, it's a whole different world. It is a whole different world. And I always, you know, uh, we really haven't done a lot of llama showing since COVID and, you know, since everything going on around here. So I'm uh, looking forward to getting back out again this year and uh, trying to take as much footage as possible, you know, so people can kind of, you know, see what it is. And it's, it's fun. It's crazy. It's just a whole nother world for sure. So. Well, cool. Well, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so See you later. So, of course, I had to uh, reach out and get you on this lineup as well, because sadly, even though we are not that far from each other, lady, we have not really had a chance to see each other at all. We usually get together for sushi dates. So I, know. I can't even think when the last time is we had a chance to get together. I, I When I've needed product, you've been like leaving it on your door. <laughs> on your porch for me to pick up because we were just missing each other all the time well but which i do need to make i i need to uh do another pickup very well, soon well good and i'm around now so hopefully we'll get okay. a chance to see each other but yes so lisa loves my sad as well and and uses that quite extensively actually at one point i'm like are you eating it it's like what are you um, well, I stock up. I got to have yeah. some here and some at the store and some in, you know, in the Hamptons and I give it away as gifts yeah. and the, the lip, the little lippies are in like every coat pocket, <laughs> which I think I have to, they're in the coat pockets from last year. So, which is why I think I need a restock. Cause I think I should probably, you know, put fresh ones in. Yeah, okay, well, and you just see, they stay pretty good. And even if it's maybe not something you want to put on your lips, I use those as a cuticle stick all the time. So kind of works great that way too. Um, so let's go back. Like, talk to us about your your knitting journey. Like, when did you start knitting? Where did it come from? Like, how did you get to where you are now as a amazing designer? And just... Well, 
I'll take that. I don't know about the amazing designer. I can design. Um, so I started, um, I started out as a graphic artist. I was not a knitter growing up. I did not know how to knit. My mother didn't knit. She was, she had gone to FIT, but didn't really have a career at all. Um, but she was artistic and always crafty. I was went to um, University of Michigan School of Art, graduated um, in graphic design. I started working in that field. And then when I stopped, when after I got married and got pregnant and stopped for a few years to have my kids, those few years were the years where that whole industry just pivoted and changed and everything went from being done by hand to being done by computers. So it was like, I couldn't have timed it any differently to any worse. Uh, like I didn't even have an intro into that when I left. It was, it had not started. And then by the time I was kind of ready to go back, it was all on computers, but you had to learn these intense computer programs and I had three little kids and I didn't have the time to sit and learn those as and relearn sort of how to do the design that I was so happy and comfortable doing by hand. So I started needlepointing. I started at my own business doing personalized party favors for kids. Like I, don't for, even, I don't even think I know any of this. It, that was called favorite favors. That was oh. the first thing that I started doing because the kids were going to parties and getting these horrible, people would spend money on horrible things that they had to give stuff, you know, as a party favor when every time when the kid left the party and we had drawers of drunk of junk that my kids would just collect and never use and it was just like a waste of money so I started trying to do like one thing and then I did it for my kids and I did it for my friends and then I started personalizing them so there's my little artsy graphic background and wrapping everything up pretty with ribbons and paper and um so that became like a little side business that I could do and make a little bit of money. It was basically making taxi money. So that that <laughs> kept me so busy that I didn't have time to walk to pick up my kids at school. So that was my taxi money that I was like, do that. And then I could take taxis back and forth and around the city. I love the creativity of that though. Like in the whole idea behind it. It was, it was, uh, it was a very, it was a good business. I could have developed it and made it bigger if I wanted to. But at that point, the kids were at a point where they were all at the um, local PS6, local school. And I was just at school so much. And I became, I was getting involved with stuff at school. And by default, somehow I became PTA president. <laughs> <laughs> Well, wait, and I, I, so speaking of like little children and all of this, like this is live, you know, this is all like haphazard. So I'm going to ask you to keep talking um, because okay. um, my children have been locked out and their father um, oh. has like left. And um, so I need to get everybody in the house because I basically have dogs and pigs around my feet here. If I could change oh. the view, I would let everybody see them. So you keep telling the story. I'm going to jump off screen for a second and get everybody inside and I'll be right back where was I <laughs> so <laughs> if anybody has any questions or wants to you know get involved in the conversation that's fine anybody that has raised kids on in Manhattan on the Upper East Side knows the drill you're just like constantly it's different from being in the suburbs where you're just like constantly you're in a cab one person one kid's going one place one kid's going the other they there's walking carpools where you know instead of getting in a car one mom taking the kids from place to place one mom would be selected to like walk to the walk the kids after school from you know activity a to activity b kind of a thing and then pick them up so i had hebrew school and we had the soccer gymnastics whatever they were doing they were going in all different directions but 
being involved at school, I am not very good at public speaking. I'm not very good at talking about myself. Never very comfortable about this, but somehow they elected me PTA president. So I, uh, I did that and I just realized that I couldn't do that and the kids and the party favor business and, you know, just stay sane. <laughs> So be be varied is what my husband says. <laughs> so I decided to give up the party favor business, and I was just doing that. And then I started needle pointing from a local store. That store also had knitting. So um, and I started working at the needle point store because, of course, whenever I go to do something. I get in so into it that I get like, I go above and beyond. So then I like was there so much that I started working there. And at one point they said, Oh, can you just help the people in the knitting section? And so I quickly taught myself how to knit so that I could help them and te- you know, work in the, still work in the store. And so I was just really learning how to knit along with, so were you the self-taught customers. then with regards uh, to the knitting? I had actually learned to knit when I was pregnant with my daughter, Erica, who is now 35. Uh, there was a little knitting store around the corner from my apartment, and I had learned to knit. I knit a few baby things and a sweater for Andrew that never fit and he never wore. <laughs> and <laughs> Everybody's got those, right? My... Um, my mother-in-law lived in the building and she helped me a little bit. So, you know, I, but then I just stopped. Then that stuff just got put aside for, you know, like 15 years. So well, I totally I didn't remember. And ask you for a second, only because in terms of like diving into things. So Dawn yeah. is actually asking if you made uh, what is behind you. Oh, no, this is... Um, Before I was even involved with fiber arts or anything like that, this is a piece of felted artwork by an Israeli artist that Andrew and I bought when uh, when we were newly married from a gallery in Chicago. And it came as a tapestry rolled up to hang on the wall like a rug. And we didn't. We had it hung for a short time and then we had it rolled up in a closet for about 15 years. Oh, and wow. I, yeah, we, I really totally even forgotten about it. It was just rolled up in the closet because we didn't know what to do with it. And I was, I had the little kids. I didn't want anybody touching it and playing around with it. Um, we finally did an apartment renovation when my kids went off to college and um, and I had it framed. I had it sent out and had it professionally with the wooden frame so that we could hang it up um, like a real piece of art. So it it's is, beautiful. I know, very colorful. Oh my God, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Well, thank you for asking yeah. that, Don. Because <laughs> honestly, I couldn't tell if it was like a textured painting. You yeah. know, like, it looks textured, but... I, I had no idea. So I was just kind of assuming it was a painting, had no idea that there would be that whole story behind it. Yeah, it's it's kind of cool. I know it's very colorful. It's kind of like directed the the colors that I, you know, then have put around the house. So orange. We have a lot of orange now because of <laughs> well that look, see, well, I feel like we're like coordinating here. We didn't even purposely do that. So yeah. So really like jump forward. I mean, so all of that journeying and then, you know, you put it down for a little bit. I mean, and now knitting is your career. You know, you not only, you know, work at the yarn store, but, and and do so much for them, but you know, you design on your own for other people. Like, so like how- Well, um, I can I can say how that quick, that transition yeah. quickly happened. Working at another yarn store, I took classes with Shirley Payton. And anybody that's listened to me speak before, she is my knitting guru. If you don't know who she is and you are a knitter, you should look her up and check out what she does on social media, what she does to support and bring um, the support the world of hand knitting, the hard 
what she's trying to do is really raise the level of hand knitting and make it uh, make hand knitters more valued, um, make their work more valued, what they do, and support designers and bring them up to a publishing level. But that what she that's what she's doing now. Back then she was just she was teaching. I took some classes. I knit something she said let me take this to vogue knitting magazine with me when i go you know with my things and see if they might want to publish it and they did and that was my first the first time that i got something something published and so that got me sort of got me an in to to know um to start in the publishing industry and what um, other from then I just, yeah, it was just you... slowly, the first store was called The Lion and the Lamb. Oh, okay. Was, was on the Upper East Side, had um, needlepoint and knitting. And then I went to work at a store in Scarsdale called Sticks and Strings. I feel like that's um, a good thing, but other people probably have similar things to that now. I mean, because either of those, they're not still active, right? No, they're yeah. they're not. And then I came, um, I started working at Annie's yep. Yarn Shop, which is a few blocks away, for, was on Madison Avenue and now they're on 2nd Avenue. And there was a point in time where I was not working at a store and Linda Morris, who owned String, I have to backtrack a little, I was in a knitting group with a group of women that I'm still in a knitting group with, starting from when I was at the line in the land, women that I knew from that, that long ago, and we are still in a knitting group together. And one of those women knew Linda and recommended me to work for her. I went in one day, she said, sit here and see if you can help this solve this woman you know this this customer's knitting issue and <laughs> I was like all right let me see and I was able to do it she's like okay you're hired so that was that was when string Linda Morse had started string um as a store on I don't know dates I'm sorry I'm really bad with years but she had started on Madison Avenue and 79th Street she when I first started working there it was a townhouse on 82nd street between park and lex and we were there for a number of years three four years and then she moved the store to 65th street so that was a third location for string and that was where the, uh, the first location was when I brought in uh, Becky. That's mm -hmm. okay. That was, we went over that story a few yeah, nights yeah. ago. So that was when I had known Lori from Scarsdale. Work I worked with Lori at Sticks and Strings. Oh, and, her mom. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And then when I was working at String and Becky needed a job, and I then recommended Becky for the job. So that's how Becky came into our lives. Uh, uh, so, so like if somebody comes to string like so what is your role there I mean because look you have so much talent so I'm sure you're not like just behind the register even though you could do that and I'm sure you're not just selling people yarn so what's your what's your role there uh currently I am the manager I am the default manager <laughs> I I kind of know the whole business. I know everything I can do, everything. I would rather not be behind the register all day long. I'm very happy teaching people. I'd rather be teaching and selling, putting things together, putting, you know, come in and you want a project. Um, it's most, that's the most fun is like finding projects for people to do and finding the yarn that they're going to do it with and mix, mixing and matching colors and then get watching them knit all these things that I wish I had the time to knit. <laughs> you get to live vicariously like, through them, right? I, I totally do. I, yeah. Like Deanna, that shawl that you're wearing, I was helping a customer with that. And it was so 
beautiful and looked very interesting to knit. And I wish I had the time to knit one for myself. But, you know, I, I, yeah, I live through watching, you know, other, well, my other, not, my customers knit. Yeah. The well, name was I, Midnight in Berlin. I wrote it in yeah, for you. You did. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And so I, uh, you know, I always say the same thing all the time too, because even though admittedly, I don't knit a lot anyway, you know, I used to knit more when I had time. And so now for me, it's just, again, being able to maybe not necessarily the patterns, but, you know, seeing people work up the yarns and, you know, again, just living vicariously through the pictures they, they send or tag on. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's great to see people enjoying it that way. Now I know, are you guys back to do it? So you guys are totally back to doing like in-person classes in the store, but are you still doing what you were doing during COVID? Cause I wanted to share that, but I wasn't sure if you were. So are you still doing any of your online zooming instruction? So that online Zoom instruction started because I had been doing a class at String called Directed Knitting. And uh, it was just a really nice group of women rotating, a lot of the same people, a lot of new people coming in all the time. And then with the COVID shutdown, I we felt like you know everybody still wanted to connect and be together and we all our worlds changed with zoom obviously so i started doing that on zoom started doing my classes plus we opened it i just had i don't know where it was posted but we started getting people from all over the country on this one zoom group and it was tuesday nights and thursday afternoons during the shutdown and these women all just gelled. It was a great group of, of people from all different like areas, states, walks of life, ages, um, religions, you know, it was, they're so happy to be together now. Like once they got to really know each other, that when the store reopened and no, I didn't have time to continue it was a free zoom that I was doing with these women and it was I looked forward to it because I wasn't working all day in the store you know I'd take some time off in connect. the afternoon you know or the morning or whatever because I knew I was going to have the energy to to do that with those people so once the store reopened I didn't have that energy anymore <laughs> one of the women decided to be stay as a moderator and keep it going and they're still doing it and they're still meeting twice a week, which is really, really nice. I feel bad that I don't have the energy to join them at 7.30 at night. I'm doing this and I picked a day that wasn't a work day. <laughs> you should have heard her earlier when I was talking to her and we were just kind of getting ready for it. She had like such despair. I'm like, Lisa, are you going to make it? I'm like, you know, she was just like, oh, I'm exhausted. So uh, I, can, I just uh, had to get out of the day pajamas. You know? I know, I know. And I could totally understand. Like some people are more morning people. Some people are more night people. Um, but so just to ask, I mean, so this group that is still going, is that a group people can join? Or is it a pretty static group at, you know, where they're at? And that, yeah, that's a pretty static group. Okay. I think they're just, I don't think they're looking for new people for Are that group. Are you still but, offering instruction? On, yes. Good. Tell us yes. about that. So my in-store group, I start was able to start back again uh, this fall. The store is very small. Last year, we were a pop-up. So from 65th Street, we moved the store, moved to 75th Street and Lexington pre-COVID for about five years. And then we shut down during COVID and we lost our lease there. So we were kind of floundering for a little while. And we were able to find this great small space that just downstairs from where we had been. So really staying in the same neighborhood, literally on the same block. But even better because it's ground floor. It's in the middle of the block. People have been walking in. They didn't even know that we had been upstairs for five years, you know, they were, and they live in the neighborhood. So that was a pop up last year. And it went so well that the owners, our current owners, decided that they would they would keep us going. So we've extended the lease 
for now for another year. So, and we'll see, hopefully this will be a permanent spot for string. So since we realized we were gonna stay, I rearranged some furniture and bought a table that I can kind of slip out and open up and have like six people at, at, you know, at the max sit around the table. But what I've been doing is keeping Zoom on at the same time now. So oh, okay. I have, for people that cannot come into the store, can't make it in for whatever reason, now that people are getting, you know, there's stuff going around again and people don't want to sit, go in, you know, and sit with a mask or go into, you know, and sit but with so small groups. Just ask you so that we can bring relevance for people that are with us. So yes. is this something though that other people like that are not even, you know, regular customers of string because they can be on- And Zoom sign up for, yes. Okay. So it's called directed knitting. It's thank you for your helping me. I'm not good at promoting myself. I know that. <laughs> so it's called directed knitting. It's on the um, classes and events page at the String Yarns website. And you can go and sign up. We do charge for the- in-person classes, I charge $12. So you just have to sign up for those. And actually it's really just on uh, on your honor that you're paying for them because I don't check it. I don't run like a class list or anything. I kind of just- So many people, I just wanna clarify. So people that wanna come in to that class via Zoom, they just via... pay the $12 as well? No, yes, I have to pay it too. Right. So right. it's on, on your honor. I mean, you can, you're welcome to come and try it sometime without having to pay and see, you know, if you like being part of the group. It is, everybody's working on their own projects. It's probably like your community at night things where everybody's kind of working on their projects. Everybody knows each other and it's just like catching up, you know, on what they're doing. If they want to learn something new, I'm there to show them how to do it. If it's via Zoom, I have one of those little task cameras mm -hmm. that I hook up and I can demonstrate how to do certain things. So I would be happy to have anybody, you know, join us for um, for directed knitting. It is Tuesday and Wednesday mornings from 10 to 11 because I have to do it before the store opens. No, I have to be I in the store and I have to do it before the store opens and then put everything away once the customers start coming in. Now, I know, though, that during COVID, you were also doing one-on-one -on -one instruction. So is that something that you're still offering? Because, look, there's a lot of people that don't have, you know, a local yarn store that's maybe close enough to them or maybe one that they like or maybe one that is skilled enough, perhaps, you know, to answer questions or maybe somebody is working on one of your patterns. So are you still doing any one-on-one -on -one type instruction? Uh, it hasn't really come up actually, but I would do it. I have done short one-on-one -on -one Zooms with people that are working on uh, maybe something that's my pattern or something that's a store pattern. I have done, you know, short things with them, but I haven't really done one hour private paid Zoom lessons. Okay. That just hasn't come up, but we do them in the store in person, sure. a half hour or an hour. And the store is so small that you're really like, you're separated from other people. It's, you know, it's not, um, it's not, it's, it's comfortable to come in and have like a one person private lesson. I'm able to do that. I'm only in the store two days a week. I'm in Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So I can, and I pretty much do the lessons on Wednesday, because on Tuesday, I'm on the register. We have such a small staff. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. That's what this is all about, especially after COVID. We're just all happy we're back and seeing mm -hmm. people. And so let's do some fun questions. So in terms of yarn and, you know, all of your wealth of knowledge and experience, so it can either be brand and I'm not fishing, but I mean, mm -hmm. I was just like, in terms of like fiber that you like to work with, I know there's a lot of cashmere at string, you know, but that doesn't mean it has to be your favorite, but is it your favorite? So what's your, what's your, you know, favorite fiber yarn blends, you know, to be able to work with? 
I mean, it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so why? It, Tell us why. I'm spoiled. I, I don't have. I mean, I work with other fibers all the time, but it's just because I have the cashmere on hand and I'm exposed to it. Um, I do things in other fibers all the time. I just was. I brought out like a selection of. I just finished the third baby blanket that I have a whole stack that I'm trying to catch up on. I have a whole bunch of nieces having babies. Either they've had them already and I haven't gotten the blankets to them yet, <laughs> or, or they're, on, they're on their way. And so I've been doing different patterns, different fibers, and I just completed one. I had done, here, I'll show you. So this is our my sampler blanket in a baby version so. and perfect because but. that is also one of the things that is in our raffle basket and we oh, did not good. even plan that so lisa's sampler blanket book um which is valued at 20 dollars, is one of the items that is in our basket so and that's if anybody has a question on why that is a book and it's just a very it's a 30 page pattern. It took a while to um, that was my COVID project was making that pattern into a cohesive book. Yep. So here we go. This is it right here, guys. So but let's just go back to fibers for a minute. So I had this um, cash set up which is a cashmere silk blend. Oh, wait, I had called? a bat. Hmm? What is it called? Cash Seta. Did it you make a, that up or that's? No, what? no, it was, I mean, the yarns come from Italy. The Seta, I guess is silk. And okay. it was the name of the yarn, Cash Seta. Okay. But I had had a bag of this white Cash Seta sitting here for a really long time. And I said, all right, it's time to use it. I'm going to make this blanket with it delicious. I love it. I'd use the same yarn to make a blanket for my granddaughter. So I did that one. And then the next one, I used a pattern that is a slip stitch pattern that is very popular in the store that was designed by Lydia Karabinich. I, if she's going to listen to this, she will be happy that I give her. I'll give, I'll give Lydia credit you know, where it's due because she is amazing. So, but this is just a, a blanket, slip stitch blanket pattern. And I used a yarn called Venezia that we have in the store. And it's just light and um, it's a cashmere lamb's wool blend. And this is leading up to the answer to your question. And then- <laughs> I had a bag of cashmere, pink cashmere that I had not used for my blanket. I saw my post this for my granddaughter. I had not used this yarn. I'm like, all right, let me use this yarn. I love that. And so I did. This was a, it's a plaid um, pattern that I had sort of created for my son for a college blanket. This pattern, and then. Working in the store, I revised it as a baby blanket version for my customers, and I hadn't ever made one before. So I used the cashmere to make this baby blanket, and I don't want to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it could be a lap blanket, or you could make it another could. one. Oh, I will, I will, but I, I oh, have to no say, way. after using the, the different luxury fibers that I have used, I decided that this one was my favorite. <laughs> well, that came out beautiful. Cause is that like a pink and gray and white? It's, yeah, it's pink and gray and um, and white stripes. That's beautiful. And then, so you just, it's very easy. It's called Ethan's Blanket on Ravelry. And um, it's just- Oh my God, wait, so that's great. That's enough. Well, so let's also, so you are on Ravelry. Your patterns are yes. on Ravelry. So how can mm -hmm. they find you there? Lisa Hoffman Knits. Great. I've kind of branded everything under the same name. So it's all Lisa Hoffman Knits. Excellent. Uh, but what I wanted to explain about this is what makes it really fun and interesting is this was just a ribbing. So where these stripes are, 
was a pearl, it was just a knit pearl, knit pearl, one by one ribbing section. And then I used a crochet slip stitch to carry the yarn up along the, the pearl ridge to make the vertical stripes. Cool. So it's something that's done after you knit the whole blanket, which is a little bit, it's a lot in the finishing. It's a lot to do in the finishing, but it's kind of worth it. Cause I was just and it's say, not it might really be a hard. lot, but sometimes it's in the details, it, right? It, it is. makes the absolute difference and it's worth mm -hmm. that little bit of extra effort. So, and it I is. love, I love plaid. Uh, and actually, interestingly enough, you're wearing plaid. So that's pretty funny. I, <laughs> but it is, I love it. So I do love that blanket. It's absolutely beautiful. So great job. Thank with you. That. So that answers that, yeah, question. I mean, I'll knit in anything. I'm working on some merino things now, and um, I will knit in, you know, anything that Ta when Tabitha hands me her luscious fibers, whatever, you know, whatever blends they are, they're always wonderful to knit with. But every fiber has its different properties, and then and it tend it lends itself to what you want to make it. So the first one we should talk about is the one that I first did for you was the vest, I think. Right? Oh, no, no, no. I don't think that, that was not the first. No? no? Couldn't have been. I feel, I, I don't know. I, I'm like, now I'm not even sure, but I actually, they all dropped on the floor. I did, I mean, only because, and this is not, because this platform, like I said, again, it's, it's not about me. It's about bringing value to everybody. I want people to know who you are, you know, follow you on Instagram, check out your patterns on Ravelry. But why I would love to just run through all the ones that you've done for me is because when I look at it and when I look at the diversity, that's what I think is so cool. I mean, I have everything from the simplest and my absolute favorite pattern, um, you know, to something that is more detailed like the vest. But I don't think the vest was first because who would I be if I just was like, okay, I barely know you. You've not worked for me before. And I give you this whole like couture, you know, thing in mind that I have. So it could not have possibly been. I feel like the classic Hampton wrap. Yes, actually, because we named this one, the, the vest ended up sort of being named after the classic Hampton wrap because using the Hampton classic as sort of like our pivotal, you know, of when we released this. So I do think looking at everything here, I do think that that was the first and, um, even if it isn't, we could start with that, of course. There's probably dates on the patterns, but we'd have to look back. <laughs> Why would we be so smart to do that? <laughs> I only got smart every time I needed to like do additions to the patterns to actually put the revised date on so I could, you know, keep track of that. Um, but I know, so basically what I'm wearing, but as the cowl version of it which essentially it's the same thing I will say if any of you have been with me before you know that I always say my two absolute workhorses are two most knitted patterns is my little rivers poncho that Rosemary Drydsdale's daughter did for us Annabelle Spear and my classic Hampton wrap I mean hands down so much so that it was originally in a fingering weight we now revised it to a sport weight um but the story behind this was and I, and I have my other version here that you can just see it without it being like in a cow. But the story with this was before I really had my whole yarn line and, and knitting line, I bought this piece, um, wasn't from Chico's because I have another piece that I styled after Chico's. Oh my God, it's like my favorite store in Tanger and now they're no longer, it was like a really high end, like high fashion store. Anyway, I bought this piece. It was just like this big infinity, like you could wear it as a scarf, but essentially what I loved about it is it draped over your shoulders, just kind of hung like around kind of like your middle section, which was awesome to cover that if you felt like it. And I wore it to the Hampton Classic, which is a really big, high-end socialite horse show here out on Long Island. And repeatedly, hands down, like I could have sold the piece off my body like a million and one times. I'm like, this is mine, my personal thing. I'm like, this isn't for sale. <laughs> like, this is my clothes. And so 
that's when I came to and I was like, all right, look, we have to do something, you know, similar to this style of wear. And then really it's just a super simple basket weave pattern. Mm -hmm. and I think why it has worked so well over the years is because it's not crazy construction. It's so simple. It's simple to knit, but the way that it works for all body styles, you know, and the way that it works in terms of it being a shawl, like I say, that you don't have to zhuzh because it just sits on your shoulders. And then again, the nice thing is, is, you know, if you feel like you want to, you can make it longer, you can make it shorter because you're knitting it on a straight needle. That's the other thing that was genius about it you know, here's this big circular piece I gave you and you're like, no, we're just going to, you know, do a provisional cast on or, you know, seam it at the end. And so I have had a few people leave it open as a stole, but I think again, the beauty of it is, you know, having it in the circular fashion. And then if you make it long enough, then you can also double it up and wear it as a cow. I like it like that. It really is. I mean, you know, and the thing is like, I love it because I'm a turtleneck kind of girl. So I love like a big squishy thing around my neck, but it also allows you like hands down, Lisa, this is like a pattern you can use all seasons, right? Because we did the original yeah. alpaca in the summer and we did it in the summer. Yeah. yeah. We released it in the summer because I'm a girl where I didn't always like my shoulders being bare. You know, if I was wearing a little dress or something, you just wanted something on, but you could could wear it with a tank top and jeans or you could wear it over a dress and dress it up and then as the weather gets cooler you can wear a long sleeve you can wear a turtleneck you can do whatever or do this and then one more thing that my my Becky not not Becky Kevelson but we call her Becky with the good hair for those of you that zoom with us a lot she moderates my chat she'll do it where she doubles it like this but then she pulls part of it up over because you can also kind of like make it like a hood it's like a turtleneck oh. and a hood you know the way she like kind of judges it so I don't know I mean it speaks for itself but it's just a million times over it's uh it, it just was a great piece it just Good worked here it's like one of those things that just went viral and we didn't even yeah. try. It's just like an organic, uh, organic. It's also good because gauge is not that important. And yeah. even, yeah. you know, somebody makes it and it ends up being a little bit looser or a little bit tighter. You just change the way you wear it a little bit, you know? Well, and not... the beauty is because the original pattern was done to fingering weight. But if I remember correctly, I didn't pull out the patterns done on like a seven or an eight needle on a fingering mm -hmm. weight. So it's meant to be open. So it still like goes quick. Um, and then actually, you know, then we've bumped it up to the, the sport weight version, which my two, my people, you know, our, our yarn drop the other night um, that we did with the um, Cormo blend. This is sport weight. So I honestly think also, too, this would make a really, really squishy. This Ooh, is that looks like a pretty color, too. What? Is that brown? It looks a little like reddish. Oh, what? Okay, because you missed the conversation last night, and I know people that were on with me are like dying because, of course, also when we got on the on on before we recorded, um, my dear Elizabeth Fenson was uh, was razzing me because that's the thing. It's like it it you know we had this whole conversation. I'm not going to bait you. What is your opinion on what people think of brown yarn versus other colors? Well, there's so many different browns. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's it's hard to say. I mean, some people come in looking for like customers come in and will look for a specific, like a chocolate brown or a dark brown. I, I don't know what you're trying to what I didn't want to what be are you trying to get to. Yeah. It was just last night we um uh Colin and Siri, you know, we, we were having lots of discussions about the actual fiber on the animals and then how it translates into the yarn itself. In my experience, hands down, and I will die on this sword, no matter how much people say they like brown, I know there's some people, Jennifer Andrus, Elizabeth, you know, there's, there's some people that genuinely do, but hands down, people say they like brown. But if you look at all my yarns across the board, and Siri even said this, they had a brown yarn, it sells slower. 
it, it just does. And then especially on the animals, I actually, I don't, I, I sort of like tongue in cheek, put this outfit together in a way, but it was also because I wanted to wear your wrap and I wanted to wear a darker color, but we have a lot of animals in this kind of like cinnamon red brown color and people love it on the animal. But then when we translate that to a yarn, it's a little like, eh. so we are always trying to make like brown look exciting, you know, in, in that sense. Um, so that was the I, whole I, story. I, that's why I, I do get that. Brown. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, why. it's true. When you put brown next to other gray, what? I mean, gorgeous. Anything. Yeah. And gray, it's everybody so cool. wants to knit with, you know, with gray. It just seems so much more neutral. Well, especially but, in New York City. It's the whole Well, I always tell people to white. buy black and knit with color. Yeah. Because people want, you know, like they want to black this and they want to black that. I'm like, you don't want to knit with black. You want to knit exactly. with color. It's just so much more fun. Well, and especially when you're looking at something, and I do see the question, I'll jump into it, but especially when you're looking at something that's an outerwear, you know, and a lot of times people want to gravitate towards the colors that they're drawn to, but then like you just said, you have to say to people, what do you wear? Because if you wear black, white, gray, you need to do something else because it's going to be over that piece. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at least that's the fun stuff that I have when we're doing shows and just like you said in the store trying to help people choose colors but this was a yarn drop we did the other night and it actually is a brown base but it has like a plum tone to it and then it has what we call a fire star so it's kind of like a, a multicolored dyed nylon you know that's in it um so it was just, you know, we've been talking a little bit about it. And I know some people do have it in their carts, but um, it's a very squishy and like, oh, I would just love this around around my neck as one of these. But to answer the questions that I see there, guys. So in the fingering weight, the classic Hampton wrap, it takes two skeins. And then because so many people were asking for it in the sport weight, Lisa was kind enough, actually not that long ago, um, to re-swatch and uh, be sure that we could sell it properly, you know, change needles a little bit. And so then it's three skeins for the sport weight. But again, the nice thing is, is as you're knitting it on a straight needle, you can still be draping it over your shoulder. You just decide where you want to end. It's not, you know, any particular measurement other than, you know, what works for you. And obviously you're guided, you know, based on the pattern. So, so that was this piece. And that of course has been a, a huge workhorse. I have like some things around me. I don't have a lot of samples right now because again, with COVID, we really didn't always have a lot of need for samples. And then I usually take an opportunity during the holidays to move some of our samples along. And then of course, we're gonna start fresh because we've got Vogue Knitting Live coming up in February. So we need to get knitting around here and get our new samples going. Um, but well, your fibers are always changing too, so yeah. you need to update them. I don't, you can't though, have I... samples of fibers that are not available anymore. So you know what? Believe it or not, I do, um, <laughs> and and it works because I really do feel like most of my customers have the ability to look beyond that. Now, inevitably, somebody's going to see this and they're going to say, "Oh, I want to make that. What's that yarn?" And yes, this is Tiger's Eye, and no, I don't have it in stock right now, um, but. I feel like because we're so small, you know, don't forget you're dealing in a yarn store where like, oh, if you need more of this yarn, you just dial it up and get it shipped to you. I have such a limited quantity in many of my yarns that I don't want to use them up just to, you know, knit up a sample. Yeah. Now, yeah. my hack around that is I can <laughs> certainly do samples in like white picket fence or like, for instance, this is another one of our real popular ones uh, that you did for us. And this is in our pink clove. I always have pink clove so I can get away, you know, with doing it sometimes that way. But I don't want every sample to be in like, you know, blush and and white. So, you know, we change it up. But um, I don't even I think I knew it, the original one it was purple. It was Isn't in it? our um, it was in one of our um, silk saris. It was mm -hmm. in one of those blends, like a um, purple twilight. It was it was a little different from that. I think if I had to advise people, there's such beautiful um, intricacy in this with the lace work that I think too much of a speckled yarn, you know, takes away from you know it a little bit. Now, do you happen to remember what um, like what 
pat not the pattern this is the west hampton duel dunes cap, yeah but the is there a name for uh the name of that lace i don't know but um it does look so pretty in that light color yeah i have to say <laughs> no and that's i mean that you know but look these are the things we learn along the way and this was one that i didn't even have an inspiration i I don't even know how we came upon it, but you were like, okay, I'll take a skein and you I'll just sent me yarn. And yeah. And what I do is I'll just swatch and kind of see what, you know, I'll do some, a little lace, a little, you know, slip stitch, a little, I'll try different things with a fiber to see what I really want to do with it. And that's and, sometimes, you know, fun for me because sometimes I like to micromanage if I have an idea, like I have one of my inspirations here, but then other times, which I think this was very much for you, this, you did a, um, this is our Shelter Island Cal, but the original version was you really loved, I had a white and a gray alpaca silk yarn. It was Bliss and maybe it was Wedding Bells. And I remember you loved it or somebody in the store had it there was a story behind it somebody had the yarn and you just wanted to one of my customers bought it from you yeah at Vogue Knitting Live I think and I came up with a pattern for her in it and then I thought it was so great that I redid it for you yeah and this is another one too it's like super simple it's just a big tube it's just knits and pearls you know and it ends up being like a really nice cow but you or yeah a hood that's what the customer wanted she yep. wanted something that was a hood and the yarn was just so drapey that it worked really well to be able to do that yep so that was another and again super super easy this is two skeins of our our sport weight so that's one that goes like accessories always go really well i mean because our yarn is a little more expensive so if people can only get a skein or two it's really nice you know for them to be able to do that um that that's a good travel project because I mean, it's not a lot of thinking once you cast on in the yeah. round and then you just you know keep going yeah no it's definitely super easy great mindless knitting um for sure now i almost forgot about this one and i don't have either of the uh of the samples but we now call it the deep wells and it's not at my fingertips but do you remember this scar love that yes so this, um, it's it's our deep well scarf, and then you, I think the hat came. I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. But we I have think the hat. hat came. I think the hat came first, and then the scarf. Oh wait! And See, I totally remember Becky was the first. My first. I think that might be Becky's hat. I don't know what? if that's the original one. Yeah, Becky would model that. For Becky, me in this so, so Becky from Clinton Hill Cashmere was my model. I love <laughs> it. But uh, it's a little hard to see with the reflections. And if I remember correctly, isn't this a faux cable? Yes. Yes. So that's yeah. also the beauty of it. But it also has these adorable little baubles on it. And it's basically like a cute little ski cap. Um, and let me tell you, this thing is durable as anything because that original sample I had forever that you did for me. We did it in like cream color, so it was really versatile. Um, but this is a real cute one in our sport weight. That's one skein. And then you ended up doing the scarf to uh, to match it. So the scarf is using that faux cable with the little bobbles on the ends. And a lot of times people buy it as a set or sometimes people just do the one skein you know, versus the two skeins for the scarf. But again, I don't even know where this came up from. I just gave you yarn and you just- I don't remember, but some, and, you know, I'm sure for customers, it's the same as for me. Once I like get into a stitch pattern and I have it memorized and I, and I like doing it, I'll do it again, you know, and, and again, or I'll change it around. I'll make it into something else that same stitch pattern because you take the time to memorize something and then you have it in your head you might as well just do it again so and i see ruth ann is, is commenting that she she loves her shelter but, and cow oh good I mean, a lot of my lifers that are on here i know they've done some of these things and erin i did see actually your order would have went in the mail today if the post office wasn't closed um but uh erin grabbed three of the um turkey red and uh this is the yarn that we were saying and so she's going to be doing the um Classic Hampton wrap, she says in uh, in that yarn as well. So that'll be cool. I'll look forward to seeing that. Now, my all time favorites, and this was like a huge 
it wasn't even an oops, but again, you just had, you had yarn. I didn't even know you had, but my great river hat. Oh, the hat. <laughs> Everybody knows this is my favorite, favorite hat to make. Favorite hat to make because it's so simple. And the original was actually more on the tweed doesn't show it very well. But the original that you made was using like one and a half skeins where you brimmed it up and it was a little slouchy. And then somehow or other, despite anybody on here thinks I don't knit, I'm the one that realized you could just get it done with one skein and not have to do so it was a great one skein project if you just didn't want to use the rib like you just did it as like a skull cap or like a beanie so for me this is my swatching hat so if i need to like show somebody what a yarn works up like super super easy highly recommend it absolutely amazing as i tell people there's no crowning so you're just seed stitch all the way to the end cinch it and you're done it's a dream yeah that that's a trick that I like to do it's amazing it's absolutely amazing does it um, even have decreases or so just, all, I have the whole thing yeah. memorized except there's actually okay. after you do the rib then there's one row where you do um you do there's one row where you decrease and there's one row where you where you increase decrease. again yeah. Yeah. So that's the only line that I obviously don't have memorized because you got to do a bunch of make ones. But um, I just love this hat. So everybody knows that because that's good maybe, to hear. Anytime, anytime somebody's like, where do you knit it or what's on your needles? I'm like, the Great River hat. What else would be on my needles? So I love that one. Um, two more to um, entertain people with. And both of these are bigger pieces. So again, I just love showing this because it's the diversity of what you're able to do, create. I'm sure you even do much, much more. But these two pieces, you must have had a lot of patience for me because I came to you with my favorite sweatshirt. So this was, this is actually a sweatshirt, but see, it's a howl attached to it. So this was my favorite sweatshirt. And I'm like, I want a sweater that's going to wear just like this. That is just a big boxy style, like something you wear on the beach kind of thing with this big, huge oversized collar that can also be worn as a hood. And while I don't have a sample currently, that is what transformed into the Turtle Cove sweater. So a bigger piece, obviously a bigger investment. I will post a picture on Instagram because a little while ago, somebody did this as their Rhinebeck sweater and you had that oh, on yeah? your screen. And I, oh, I, nice. meant to, I meant to try to post it, but I had family here today. So again, I wasn't on social media too much, but I will say this has also been a very well knit pattern for us, for somebody that's looking to make an investment in, you know, yarn because it's about six to eight skeins of sport weight, but right? Super simple. E easy. It was, e it was pretty easy to design and easy to size too, because it's, it's such a simple construction. Yeah. Oh, and you wanted right. that, you wanted that howl. It's called a howl. That's a cowl and a hood. That's the best part about it because yeah. when you're not wearing it as that, it's just a big squishy, you know, collar. And yes, I remember Julie, I feel like Julie, that's kind of how you and I first met in the beginning or started talking and Eileen Steinhauer, Eileen, you did it in that Harvest Moon yarn that I did for um, Jimmy Bean's pop-up shop, which I love that yarn. I need to do that again. Actually, I will say as a little sneak peek, the yarn that I'm doing for Kimberly McAlinden that we talked a little bit about when Kimberly was with us on the second day of Christmas. Um, I'm modeling it after that Harvest Moon yarn, Eileen. So I hope it comes out a little bit, uh, a little bit like that. Um, <laughs> so Eileen Steinhauer is normally our pink clove girl. So she's getting razzed on in the chat that uh, somebody can't believe she actually made something in other than pink clove. But um, that Turtle Cove sweater, absolutely love. And then the um, Last but not least, this was another, you know, kind of piece that I came to you with. And I 
the backstory on this that I just want to share with everybody also is kind of a conversation we had last night as well. Not everything has to be yummy and squishy. So, you know, I oftentimes will get my hands on wool that I've shorn. This in particular was a little more rustic wool, as I would call it, and it was all Long Island based. And so while I realized it wasn't necessarily a yarn that somebody was going to want to have up against their skin, I wanted to create some sort of outerwear. And while I know not everybody might be into vests, I just really was looking, I had a certain vision in my mind and I just, I wanted a button down vest. I wanted pockets. And of course I go to my crazy friends like Kimberly and Lisa and they make all my dreams come true. And so we ended up, it was called the Hampton Hunter Vest. Now, I'm certainly not going to tell you it's one of our patterns that a lot of people do, um, but it just had such an interesting stitch pattern. Um, you can see from the pictures on the front here, um, there's like two little pockets down on the bottom. So I'd like, you know, stuck the little sleeve in the pockets. So you can see that. I remember too, we went to this awesome button shop in New York City you took me there I think it's not open any longer no and, tender buttons and then that's did you where, come with me to pick those buttons I don't I remember did. yeah I did because I remember that place was amazing yeah. I've never seen a button place so like great that. it's it's, and, it's greatly missed yeah I everybody. know I can't even believe a place like that would not continue on but yeah we went shopping for these really special we had gotten these like coin buffalo coin buttons i think was on the original piece mm -hmm. so um so again if anybody loves a vest you know i think it's also just a, a good example of you know all the different things that you can um design and make and so speaking of that the one thing but, i do what oh go I, I just want to say that you are the best model whenever i see you wearing that vest at a show it you are the best model for it it, it just looks so good well, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, sometimes it's hard because like there are just certain things that right transform better when they're on somebody's body than when on the mannequin. But I oftentimes find myself like, how many times can I change throughout the day, you know, to be like having all these pieces on instead of hanging them on some weird bodies, you know, half bodies sitting in your, in your booth. So I know, but that's what happens, you know, as a salesperson, if you're wearing it, you can sell it so much faster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this is going to lead me to, and I was bad. I don't have it at my fingertips. I'm praying to God that you do. Um, because while we don't have the fairy knitting book in our raffle basket, um, we do. do have the patterns that are going to be included. Um, so while we are, you know, going to look to start to wrap up, I would love for you to just give a brief background on this because people can still go out and buy this book. I will tell you guys, it is an absolutely gorgeous coffee table book. Never mind if you're never even going to knit anything in it. It's beautiful. The, the, the stories are wonderful to read. So just uh, tell us a little bit about that. Fairy knitting. <laughs> Came up with... <laughs> Um, the idea uh, for it um, came with Alice and I sitting around trying to come up with something that we could do together. Um, if you don't know Alice Hoffman, she is an amazing author. Um, she's had um, like 30 uh, books and most of them New York Times bestselling books. And she does a lot of novels and some short stories. She had been writing short stories for Fairy Magazine. It was called at the time. It now has a new name called Enchanted Living. But she had been writing um, some stories for them. And she was she knew the editor of the magazine. And we were trying to come up with something that we could do together. And so we came up with this concept of a, a fairy tale with a knitted piece in it. And each story would have something knit and she would sort of bring it to life. So we came up with a list of things that we could do together that would work. And then she would go and write this from the list, the list of like 40 or 50 things that we had. She would just pick something and out of her creative genius mind, write this beautiful story. And then I would have to read the story and figure out how to bring whatever knit that she had written about 
to life in like a fiber, in a color that she described, in a fiber that would fit the season for the story that she wrote it in. And um, that was, it was always challenging. And then I would swatch and sketch and she would look at it and say, Lisa, what makes it magical? So everything had to have some sort of like a magic, tricky, I don't know, or just interesting element to it. I faux magic, whatever I could do to like appease her. <laughs> and we were um, lucky enough after two years of doing the, um, doing articles for the magazine, we brought it to a publisher and um, they they said they would publish it as a book. So we had to add a few more pieces and we had to re-knit some of them because some fibers weren't even available anymore. Fiber has to be available if you're going to publish a book. So it was a bit of work to get it from point A to point B. But when we finally did, um, they just did a beautiful job with the design of the book. Everything was re-photographed with this amazing photographer. We got to go to the photo session um, in Baltimore, I think it was. Um, we got to go and watch them do the whole shoot with the, with the models and the hair and the all the underpinnings and how they place them all in the settings. And all of the pictures, if you look at the book and you look at the pictures and how they all look like they're in these like outdoor settings, um, the gardens, it was all like a green screen. I they had, think I even knew that. They, they had the concept and, uh, and the way the model was gonna stand, it was all drawn, it was all set and the backgrounds were, were chosen, but then the model had to, the lighting and the model had to all work to fit into where it was, they were going to place it on the background. It was very cool to watch. That, I can't, I mean, it's awesome to be able to, I'm sure be part of, you know, a different yeah. experience like that, you know, nonetheless be able to be there. But yeah, I don't think I even knew, you know, that it wasn't, I guess I don't really know what I thought, but uh, <laughs> I just didn't really even think about it. But yeah, the book really, and I love the gold leaf on the outside and the, the, the photography is gorgeous. I mean, honestly, even if you don't knit, right? Like just to have yeah. it and the stories are really cool and it is, um, I do love how you tied it all in. Now, did, were you able to find, did you have any pieces? Any I yes. Well, I have the pieces and I have the one oh. and I can tell the story. Okay, this one yeah. was from the original um, magazine. Oh, wait, before and I forget though, let's tell people where they can find the fairy knitting book. Um, on Amazon. Cool. It's available on Amazon. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Um, so this, there was... The story is broken hearted. So all these stories are beautiful. They're all centered around women. Um, they're not very happy fairy tales. They're more <laughs> like your sad, scary Grimm's fairy tales. <laughs> but they do, um, you know, mostly have happy endings, but they're not to read to tiny little children. <laughs> um, so I had a yarn that I was going to use for this vest. Um, it was supposed so that in the story, the vest uh, is um, worn by a woman who um, had, I had, I had this all in my head about how to Say the well, stories, you know, with like a what there was because there was something in the pocket. Yeah, so she has a broken heart, and she um, finds this hunter in the woods and brings him in, and he heals her broken heart. And so she knits a sweater. She cuts. She's so upset that she. I'm probably not even saying the story correctly. So I, I'm sorry, Alice, if you're listening, but she, gets, she she's brokenhearted. She cuts off her hair and she knits a vest and, she, and, um, and then this, 
woodsman or whatever it is, hunter that she brings in who heals her broken heart, knits, t- cuts off his hair and knits a vest, uh, and knits a pocket onto her vest for her to hold her heart close to her so that it will heal. It's a very convoluted story. Anyway, um, so it had to sort of be the color of hair. That's where that's where the problems came in. And that's where it's I like go- in. Golden hair, you know, like how it's not a natural fight. It's it's it, it's hard to find unless it's a natural fiber to find a color like this. Like I was looking at yellow and they weren't gonna work. And I finally, I just, I called, I was like near my deadline and I called Tabitha. I'm like, do you have anything that you think would work? And I explained this whole thing. She just said, come and look and see what you can find. And then I found this yarn. I don't remember the name of it right now. I can look in the book, but it was like the perfect color because to match the carrot, the hair of the character. And then so at the back of it I is love like that. her like golden locks that she had cut off her curly hair locks. So that's all cables on the back. I decided not to make it just like a regular vest. I tried to, the interesting part of this is it's more like an apron. So it looks a little funky like this, but when it's worn over like a, a shirt, it looks definitely more well, like, and like an apron. So basically like the sides are all open. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it looks really cute if you have like a collared shirt underneath it. I think I, I remember that in particular or, but it's uh yeah, it's a really cute design when you're wearing it on. It's almost like a little bit of that style where you have um, just kind of a front and a back and then you just sort of tie it off on your hips, but instead it's got a piece of joints. There we go. So yeah. You can see. Yeah, you can see so that. The- we styled it with her wearing um, a dress, like over a long dress. Well, that's cute and too. then, so that's how the collar like stands up and looks, which is really great. So gorgeous. So gorgeous. So of course I was thrilled, you know, to, to be part of, part of that. And, and then we actually did a little resurgence because I, I, had your book and then last when I was doing my fiber room Fridays um I I posted it and people went crazy and then I, I think we ended up you know gifting out another um a, another bunch of them because isn't there now that I just remembered there's also a little bag in there that you did out of my yarn there was a little purple there was there I, well, I you- didn't do it originally out of no, your but yarn but when I came to do a yarn crawl yes yeah I- for you I was like sitting there a little bit bored and I'm like <laughs> I can knit something oh and so in that so, book there's a cute little drawstring yeah like, purse it's so adorable and it was just one skein of my worsted weight you just banged it right out and uh it was adorable anybody can knit it it's like the simple easiest pattern in the book So, yeah, so there's lots of, that's the nice thing too. There's lots of different patterns, you know, different levels. I think a lot of it is in a way very like couture in some ways, because that's the whole part of, you know, having it go along with the, uh, you know, with the theme and and stories, but every piece is not, they're not costumes. That was kind of what the, what the thing that the twist that I wanted to put on it, I, I didn't want them to be costumes to match the stories. I wanted everything to be a wearable Wearable piece. art. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I highly recommend guys. Um, so thank you, know, you if for the plug. <laughs> no, it's just beautiful. It really, really is. I still kept my one version. I just forgot to bring it up with me. So I've got mine on hand that uh, I just love to have and, and look at. No, I'll probably never knit anything in it. That's okay. <laughs> Like I said, it's just still great to have around for sure. So, um, so I know for, you know, kind of sake of time, as everybody knows, I mean, there's always so many different things. So two things, what's on your horizon? Am I going to see you at Vogue Knitting Live? Are you going to be running, is String going to be there? For the first time. Oh my God, I am God. First time in the history of Vogue Knitting Live. 
I finally got my wish and I do not have to have a food. It is not something that Lisa enjoyed whatsoever. I would remember, I mean, just the countless hours of you getting ready and having to organize it. And, and it is a lot. We were talking the other night with Becky about how much work it is to go to Vogue Knitting Live. But honestly, I just look forward to it because I always get a chance to see people, see friends. And like everybody says, everything happens at the bar afterwards. So well, that's why I, I will I'll end up. Uh, Do you want to work my booth? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to work the store, but I oh. will slip out for Saturday night at the bar. So That's wait, does so string is so string does not have a booth? We're not going to have a booth. We're, okay. The store is going to be open with all sorts of, you know, we're coming up with, will they have specials? Will are, we're going to have guest um, collaborations okay. and you know we're trying to think of whatever we can do to get people to come to the store since we are already a store in new york city right. the booth is bigger than our store it just <laughs> doesn't didn't make sense to try to take it and recreate it yeah you know from point a to point b where we are when we already have it so okay i know that I hope we'll be missed and I'm sorry that we're not going to be, be there for people, but everything that we did there, we will just be doing in the store and we're just a little cab or train ride away. So oh, well, I will good. miss seeing you and all the, the headaches of the setup and the teardowns and the, the no, you're not. And every, every year too, I will say it was bizarre. They came in with these like white cubicles that they would use as their shelves. And then Lisa would be like, do you want them? Do you need them? I mean, I, one, I, I hate white, but like, I, I just, you know, it's crazy to think guys how much we all buy things just for this venue. When, when this floor clears out, there's so much stuff that people just leave because they just consider it like disposable. Um, let me, before I ask you my last question, Lisa, let me come to Dawn. Dawn, I'm going to add you uh, spotlight and yeah, go ahead and ask your question, Dawn. Hey. Oh, um, my question is about designing. Mm -hmm. I um, have been knitting for many, many decades. Um, and I have a sewing background. And generally, I don't use a pattern. I am privileged that I can knit something and pretty much Amazing. Yeah. it's close enough for me. <laughs> I have been working with a dyer that has an advent and we were talking about patterns and how just, you know, having a free pattern is, and she asked me to come up with some ideas and I did. And she's like, great. Can you write the pattern? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I guess I'm kind of maybe stuck in my own head because I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, I know what test knitting involves. I've been a test knitter, okay? And I have pre-test knit for a few people before they had everybody else doing it. And I know about Yarn Pond. Do you have a tech editor? Is there a need for that? How do you know if you need one? Does that um, make tech also, editor is a very good can, idea. I was going to say, if I can elaborate also, or maybe just help a little bit, because maybe also just because I know Don, so maybe also part of the question is, how do you get to a place where you are somebody who can knit, create things, you know, but but yet make sure, how do you learn that next step of getting it into an actual pattern that is going to be readable and usable by everybody? Because it is not easy. And that's why I've backed off from working with a lot of designers. So what does somebody do in Don's case that wants to be able to take that next step? So have you have it all written out? Like, um it's basically taking writing a pattern a is, <laughs> and with notes <laughs> you know you have to just sit there it's it's hard you know to get it from your brain onto paper the same as with a story you know the knitting language already that's the hardest part for like somebody that is if you even ask somebody to help you that doesn't know the knitting language they wouldn't understand what you were trying to say so knowing 
my, the knitting I would is key. And then just look at some other patterns that you, you know, that you know are, that you can read well. Um, or, and look in the magazines and see the way they write out um, their formats for, you know, starting with sizing materials, using, oh, the Yarn Craft Council of America, I think it's called the Yarn, I forget the exact name, I'm sorry, right it's now. Watching. Yarn Craft Council. Um, they have special guidelines for, for sizing and um, symbols for, uh, to use for certain things. And, um, and they have a, um, they have the uh, abbreviations for all of the knitting language. But how there. do you get past the grading? I mean, everybody wants oh. five sizes now or to five X. So how do that you is, get? Sizing is really hard. Sizing is hard. So the Yarn Craft Council got, has all the guidelines of uh, sizes, you know, what you need to do to get for, you know, the, for the different sizes. You have to decide your ease. And honestly, I would suggest taking a class. Well, that's what um, I was just going to ask. That's what I wanted to know. I know sometimes like through yeah. Vogue Live, like, these there are, yeah. The tech editing classes? Um, it's not a tech edit. Tech editing is not what you're, first you have to write the pattern. So the tech editing is after, unless you're gonna pay somebody to do your grading for you. I honestly, most of the sweaters that I've designed, other than the few that, the, what I've done with Tabitha, I did a lot of, most of my designs were for Vogue Knitting Magazine and they only want one size and then they'll do the sizing for you. So I got totally spoiled. So I'm not very good at it. I'm not the best person to ask about grading. I am going to have to do it for myself for this new sweater that I've designed um, through a knit along with Shirley Payton. And um, I'm going to have to go through that whole process. I would, um, if you want a, a good educational experience, try taking one of her knit alongs and you'll see the professionalism of um, how she goes from start to finish and walks you through getting, you know, designing a garment and then getting the pattern written and um, some of her knit along design alongs even go to the extra step like one that we did last winter was a design along that went the extra step to teaching people how to write their own patterns. And then those were actually published in Vogue Knitting Magazine. And like Donna, the winner, so I'm winners. gonna jump in as well and say that Erin uh, was nice enough in the chat to drop in there. She said that Julie Robinson uh, has a fabulous pattern grading boot camp coming up. Oh. So, I mean, I think especially for somebody- I might like, need to take that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think that, you know, I think that while it's great to bring up because Again, as somebody who has worked with different designers and has also fallen into situations where, where you think somebody knows how to create a pattern and write the pattern, it doesn't end up equating into something that's successful for everybody to knit. And that's a big problem. Um, and, and that is so much why I have backed off of a lot of things. And I'm like, here's yarn, you know, you can use yarn substitution. But I think still in this day and age, even though we're, you know, sort of post COVID and things are back in person, there has got to be things on Zoom, you know, classes that, you know, you could look into and take. I mean, of course it's money, but if it's something that you're serious in, as somebody who wants to utilize designers, you know, it's um, definitely something very valuable, you know, to try to get that further education from somebody who's experienced, you know, like Lisa was saying. So definitely, and um, and Erin saying she highly recommends. So maybe in the chat behind the scenes or, you know, connect with Erin on Instagram, you know, if it's something she's experienced in or she's done before, you know, or if anybody else has any other suggestions, you know, drop it in the chat or find each other, you know, on Instagram, because I'm sure you're not the only person, you know, that has an interest in maybe trying to, you know, take their, knowledge a step further. 
Well, I know the Yarn yeah. Council of America has classes. Mm -hmm. And the best investment anybody can make is spending money on themselves with their education. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I just don't know if I did the... I just didn't know if that was the class to take, if that was, I mean, I know they're accredited and they're, you know, but there might be somebody else that would be, and I do like the idea of the design along a lot. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I, yeah, I check like that, that out. And I know I, Craftsy, if they're still, if the classes are still available, there were a lot of classes on Craftsy that were filmed. Um, but I actually haven't, I, know, I haven't looked recently to see because i know that they were gone but it changed to blueprint but now i think it's back to being crafty and i think if i think classes are still available so you and can I think check that out there that master's class or maybe is that what it is now um but i know there's probably pretty much things like that so i will just say mm -hmm. for the sake of this conversation you know definitely and and don as i said to you beforehand too i know you can connect you know with lisa you know behind the scenes i'm sure she'd be happy to you know make sure you've got some different directions and, and things to go in. But I think that kind of question, again, always brings value because I know there's a lots of people in our community that are fabulous knitters, have fabulous ideas, but then, right, how do we take those ideas and then actually, you know, get them on paper uh, in which then we can share them with other people. And you know what? Everybody's got to start somewhere. So look, I know nothing about it, but maybe it's not starting with a sweater that needs all this sizing. You know, maybe it's starting with an accessory. Scarves, scarves, accessories, yeah. <laughs> and that's, scarves, that's shawls, what I have yeah. designed for that's, the adventures is the scarves and, and yep. hats. So just to get um, your, just But to I get do your. know, too, with the test knitters, a lot of them won't do it unless it's been tech edited. It's a big stigma with it, and I don't, I don't know why. I, um, you can look on Ravelry for people that might do tech editing, but I'm happy to help you with your pattern formatting and, you know, and, and give you any advice that you might need to try to find somebody for that. Thank you for your time. Okay. You can make me sure. small, please. <laughs> no problem. And Dawn, you were one of the reasons why specifically earlier, you know, I was asking Lisa if she still is doing things, you know, one on one or, you know, helping people oh. in any way. Um, just because, again, that's what's amazing about this venue is we're all coming from so many different places. But yet when you've got somebody and I, I'm that's truly, you know, has skill in it, has experience in it, you know, has talent in it and has the diversity, you know, in, in the things of which you've created thus far, that's a wealth of knowledge that you really want people to be able to access. And again, now that we're all totally familiar with doing things remotely, you know, you, mm -hmm. uh, you, need, to, you need to make sure you capitalize on that because you've worked real hard to get to where you are today. And mm -hmm being able to uh to provide that to people so thank you yeah well I was honored to be one of the mentors with Shirley um there were about um five of us in the design along last year that she ran and she had people from all over the world there were people from Israel Australia um the people in Europe there were People on the West Coast. It was just literally, oh, there are a lot of um, Japan. There was a whole continuous. We had to do the, every class that we did, we had to do twice. Every Zoom that we did, we had to do it late Friday night and then middle of the day Saturday to get to cover all the time zones. That's amazing. Which was um, pretty interesting. Where would somebody, just because I know, uh, you know, some people are commenting in the chat, where, um, and thank you, Stephanie also said Crafty is still around, um, mm -hmm. but where, as far as with the, with Shirley's, is there, do you know what her handle is, website, do they just Google her name? Yeah, Google, Google her name, her web, ShirleyPayton.com, check her out on Instagram, S-P-A-D-E-N, yes. E-N or A-N? E-N, P-A-D-E-N. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, I, so I was going to ask you, so before I wrap up with my stuff, I think you sort of maybe alluded, I was going to say, what's next for you? What's on your needles? Are you designing something for somebody? What are you working on? 
Um, I'm working on some Republicans, not baby, not not baby blankets. Uh, I am. I still have baby blankets to do, but I'm working on swatches. The next thing I'm doing outside of the store is I'm teaching at the Gold Coast Knitting Retreat through the store in Roslyn called Knit. She runs a, oh, she ran a retreat. Hmm? Have I you heard of it? it? I saw, no, but I, I saw it, maybe I saw it on Instagram, but I remember seeing that not too long ago. So tell us about that. So I did it with her last year and I'm gonna do that again this year. I'm teaching four classes, two of them I had set already. One was like how to knit a sock, one was- when is this um, happening, Lisa? This is in April. Okay. Can people, is this in person? This is in person in Roslyn. You can go to, um, you can Google Gold Coast Knitting Retreat or just Knit in Roslyn. It's K-N-I-T, just that's the name of her store. And all the information is there. She has a lot of great teachers lined up. Um, a bunch of different classes, interesting things of all levels. It, you can do, it's a two day retreat. You could do both days and stay overnight. She has a hotel lined up in Roslyn, or you could just do one day if you were local and wanted to do, you know, only one day or even go back and forth. So, um, I know we've got it's, some it's a nice people. group of people and I'm interested. Um, so I'm swatching. I want, I actually thought I had them here to show these little, I'm going to teach, found it. I'm going to teach intarsia. So a basic, basic intarsia for anyone that has not, um, never done it before. So it's had a knit, we're gonna, it's gonna be a coaster or a cozy. So I've just been doing a bunch of samples and they'll have, uh, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm preparing for my classes. Awesome. Well, I know we, like I said, I know we do have a couple of local people on. So uh, maybe that will certainly be of, uh, of sure. uh, to people. So I wanted to ask that. Um, and honestly, really just for time's sake, see, again, I know Lisa was like beforehand, what am I going to talk about? I'm like, girl, don't worry. I'm like, we are going to run out of time. And again, I could keep going on, but for the sake of the fact that uh, I know people have been with us, for those of you that have been with us from the start, for those of you that have been jumping in and out, certainly appreciate it. And I just want to remind everybody as well, at least for myself, um, also remind everybody don't forget to look Lisa up on Instagram, Lisa Hoffman Knits. You can find her on Ravelry. Again, all these amazing designs that she has are available on Ravelry. Now, any of the ones that we've talked about, they are mine. Um, I've always uh, had the exclusive rights to them. So as always, guys, if there's anything of mine that Lisa's done for us, you can always get that pattern free with the appropriate purchase of yarn. So certainly when you are shopping with us, there's a note section when you're checking out and you just tell us what pattern you're looking for. And as long as you've bought the appropriate yarn to do that, then uh, you get that pattern for free. So I'm always happy about that. Don't forget, guys, that until January 5th, the evening of January 5th, you still have your coupon code from me. That's Holiday Life, L-I-Y-F. That's going to get you your 10% off. That is also going to get you in the running for the raffle basket. So remember, for every $10 that you spend, and I keep repeating this as well, because don't forget, we've got people watching us on YouTube now that we're loading that up also. So we are hoping, I will still say, I think your chances are pretty good. Um, who knows? We'll have to see what happens as we get to like January 5th and everybody starts, you know, clocking out their carts that uh, they've been patiently waiting. We do still have a great lineup, guys, as well. So don't forget that. We are coming down to the end of our 12 days of Christmas. Um, but tomorrow night, uh, we're going to be joined by Christina uh, from Chelsea Yarns. Uh, she's also known as Sparkle Knitter on Instagram or Chelsea Yarns. So she'll be with us. We are going to be dropping some news about uh, some collaborations we'll be doing this upcoming year. 
Uh, and then on January 4th, so that'll be on Wednesday night, we'll be with Amy Kidd. Um, and we do have a yarn drop for that night as well. I will also be picking up our candles, our second installment, uh, probably tomorrow. Um, so those are actually already turned back on on the website because I know they're done. I just have to get my hands on them. And then last but not least, on Thursday evening, we'll be with uh, Christy um, from Bernie Parker. Um, Bernie Parker Designs, that's all knitting inspired jewelry. So super excited about that, just to be able to do something a little different. I'm always wearing my Bernie Parker bangle. So uh, her and I just got to be good friends. She loves my salve as well. Everyone loves my salve. I mean, I end up just like meeting people because of my salve, which is great. So um, I'm excited because her and I are going to be working together as well um, on a special project this year, jewelry, knitting inspired, uh, specifically for Long Island Yarn and Farm. So I've been begging her about that. So we'll be kind of sharing some news about that on Thursday evening. And then, of course, Friday, our culminating event. So I want to thank you so much, Lisa, even though I want to like reach through the screen and hug you because I we know. have a chance to hang out. I dare say, I guess if you need to stop by for some salve, make sure you give me a call. I can see you here. Maybe we can actually make it happen. Catch her for some sushi. Enjoy a little bit of time. Otherwise, we definitely are having a drink once we get to New York City for Vogue Knitting Live. Super excited about that, of course. And <laughs> I'm just looking in the comments there. Thank you so much, Erin, for dropping that in uh, for the holiday life code. I really appreciate that. Guys, as always, you know where to find me. If you have any questions, any feedback from tonight. Again, I love this because I feel like even though we also had Kimberly McLinden on for the second day and as a designer, I feel like we got to dive into a little bit more, you know, about the designing and the background and, and really how somebody for the longest time as you have, you know, has made this a career, a sole career and have constantly changed, pivoted. You know, you've been involved in different things. So I think it's great for people to see that you can continue and survive off of something that you love and enjoy. And no wonder you're always exhausted. Um, not only that, but running around after your grandchildren as well, which is super exciting too. I don't know. No, I nowhere near the amount of energy that you have. I can't even, it <laughs> exhausts me to watch what you do every day. <laughs> Oh, that's all right. It keeps us all young for sure. So, but I appreciate it, girl. Thank you always so much for the love and support. I definitely hope that we can do another design sometime in the future, but I know things are leveling off for you. I know it was really crazy for you during COVID and you were extremely busy mm -hmm. at that point in time. So with that, guys, I thank you so much, everybody, for joining us again. Thank you, everybody. Night of the 12 days of Christmas. We are getting to the end. I hope you guys have a great evening. Thank you so much. And I uh, look forward to chatting with you guys uh, behind the scenes. So take care, everybody. Be well. Bye. Good night.